Well, good evening. Uh, I'm incredibly excited to be here on this uh, Midsummer Nights evening and to be part of the Midsummer Nights um, Science Lecture Series. I actually think it's a great uh, title, not only because of um, the, it's one of my favorite Shakespeare plays, um, but also because of it's such a good way for people to come in and see, get a whole view of a, a field that could be really complex if you got into the details of it, but get the big concepts across um, to, to everybody and then, then people can, can learn more later. Um, but the, the other thing is Midsummer Night's Dream happens to be actually one of my favorite Shakespeare's plays, mostly because it's only one of his comedies and I really like comedies. And even better is the, the principles of that play are actually very similar to the concepts I'm going to talk to you guys about tonight. So I don't know if you guys know the premise behind the play, but really it's centered around a marriage. And I'm going to talk today about a marriage between DNA and RNA that is a sort of a newly emerging marriage that we're, we're finding out is happening. And then also in this play, there's fairies running around, messing with people's minds, and tricking them into doing different things. Um, and I feel like these non-coding RNAs are doing the same thing in the cell. They're running around like fairies, grabbing proteins and doing all these interesting things and manipulating the genome's output. Um, and thirdly, and most importantly, the, the stage is set in a fantasy land. And I really think this world of non-coding RNAs that I'm gonna talk about today is a fantasy land. These mysterious creatures of RNA molecules that come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and can do all these amazing things. And so I'm gonna encourage us all to put on our sort of imagination caps and go genomic scuba diving, if you will. We're gonna go into the nucleus and sort of surf along the reefs of chromatin and DNA and look at what may be happening and how the genome may be folding into different shapes to produce different outputs. And so in true Shakespearean um, <laughs> nature, I thought uh, I'd, I'd borrow from another one of my favorite uh, Shakespeare plays, Hamlet, to, to sort of set the premise with the famous Shakespeare quote, which I'm gonna butcher and make it really nerdy, um, but uh, here it goes. So we're ready, we're gonna open the, the wardrobe into non-Codarnia via Hamlet. What to be or not to be? That is the genomic question. Tis nobler to stay an undifferentiated cell or to differentiate along different trajectories and become a liver, brain, heart, or kidney cell. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, this is actually a very profound question. If we think about it, every single cell in your body has the exact same genomic sequence, yet is folded and changed into different shapes or cell types. And moreover, as we start out as little babies and grow up into a big adults, these cells not only have to learn how to differentiate into key types of cells, but renew that same cell identity as we grow and expand to make sure the exact, there's more liver cells as your liver gets bigger. Um, and Really, this can be, we can reduce this equation into a more simple analogy. Let's think of the genome as a piece of paper, or like a stem cell as a piece of paper. We can fold this piece of paper in all sorts of different ways and creases, and then what we end up with is our, our different cell shapes or identities. In this case, it's gonna be a, a flying crane that you're, you're used to seeing. And similar in this analogy, um, that wasn't me, by the way. That's, <laughs> that's from YouTube. Um, the, uh, the, the same way that your genome can produce many different cell types, a piece of paper can also produce many different cell types. The crane shown here, and my favorite, the paper airplane. Um, and so if we really, this analogy actually goes pretty close to what we're trying to do here. So we're trying to understand how the genome's been folded in each of these different objects and learn how to rework it back. Yeah, you have a question? Tell us how to fold the centerpiece. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, that one's tricky. Uh, we can talk, I'll show you after. I can actually do it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it takes a different piece of paper, actually. That, that's a good hole in this analogy. Um, but uh, I really do think that the, the genome can be sort of made in parallel. But we'll make it even simpler to start out with. And that we'll start with, let's imagine there's only three cell types in the body. There's a stem cell that can turn into any other cell type and turn into, let's say, a square and a triangle. So how does this process happen? Well, we know a lot about DNA methylation and the histone code, which I'll talk about uh, and give a background in a minute. Um, 
But not only does it have to differentiate into these two different shapes, but these two different shapes have to remember who they are and how to exactly reproduce this after a cellular division. Because when a cell divides, the polymerase comes through, and in that wake, the DNA is stripped naked, split into two cells. It needs to have the same folds put back into place to get the proper shape. And so what I want to talk tonight about is some of my favorite part of this process, which is newly emerging, is non-coding RNA is actually playing a role in this as well. Um, and so we'll get to that in a little bit. But again, I'd like to set the stage. Uh, don't worry, no more Shakespeare. But set the stage more in a historical context. Why are we asking this question now, today? And why is this at the forefront of genomic biology? And really, we have to go all the way back to Aristotle. Oh, sorry, I gave the answer away. I was going to ask a trick question. But let's go all the way back to 300 BC, um, where there was two types of thought back in science. That, that they were, everybody was trying to figure out how a human arose. And my favorite one was, and the most predominant theory at the time, was the idea of preformation. That in a sperm hit a little tiny human being, like a little, little version of you. And you add it to the egg, and it's like putting a sponge capsule in water, and all of a sudden this big <laughs> animal pops out uh, of this, this capsule. Um, but Aristotle, and the other thought, which was very controversial because it was uh, not seemingly, um, didn't fit with a lot of the religious views, was epigenesis, that, that there could be an undifferentiated mass that took sequential stages of development to produce a human. So Aristotle is famous for many things, obviously philosophy and astronomy, but did you know he was also a developmental biologist? <laughs> Turns out he had a hobby of looking at chickens. So chickens are really a, an important part of all of developmental biology, where you, have, you can just keep an egg warm, poke a hole in it, and you can literally just sit and watch a chicken develop inside of its egg. And what he noticed and pointed out is that the embryo seems to begin as an undifferentiated mass. But at this time, they didn't have microscopes that were good enough or any sort of way of documenting this. And so people were like, oh, OK, maybe. This guy's really smart. He might be onto something. Um, and, but it sort of was left there until 1,700 years later when microscopes got much, much better. And this is going to be a recurring theme throughout the talk is how we can finally answer big questions with better and better technologies. And they allow us to move to the next biggest question. And Caspar Wolf, and unfortunately there was another guy right before him that uh, it was very close but doesn't usually get the credit, was studying kidney development. He's famous for the Wolfian duck, which is a, a part of, of a kidney. Um, and what he noticed with his microscope and watching this develop is that he saw these single cells make long tubes. Therefore, those tubes couldn't have been pre-programmed in the kidney. They had to have been developing through sequential stages, or the genome had to fold into different shapes to produce these, these uh, subcellular organelles, or these, these uh, sub-tissue organelles. And so he basically proved the theory of epigenesis, that we start out as an undifferentiated mass and take sequential steps in development. So this laid the foundation for Gregor Mendel to come on the scene and formalize this thing. And actually, he's considered the godfather of genetics, rightfully so. And I like to think of him even as the godfather of genomics, because it's just genetics on steroids. Um, and so my favorite line from him that I think sets up what he, what he did for everybody is this, this sentence here. In 1859, I obtained a very fertile descendant with large and tasty, was probably the most important part, seeds from a first generation hybrid. Since in the following year, its progeny retained the desirable characteristics and were uniform, there must be some piece of information inside the cell that is telling these things how to reproducibly become what they are. And this, is, this was dogma breaking. This was profound um, understanding at the time. Nowadays, we take it for granted. We know we think it's DNA. We know that this um, in the genomic era. But back then, the search now became on for what is this mysterious transforming principle that's passed down from generation to generation to give reliable traits such as tasty seeds. Um, and at the same time, people were still interested in sperm. Sperm has been another thing that people have been studying for hundreds and hundreds of years. And what, uh, what Robert Brown noticed is that when the sperm, um, we missed it, but uh, the sperm enters the egg, it deposits this thing he called the nucleus. And it was this piece of thing, and once that thing got into the egg, then the egg started to go undergo its developmental process. Um, and so this was the first sort of clue of what this transforming principle may be. It's somewhere in the nucleus. And so 30 years later, Frederick Meischer um, 
had this horrible lab that what he, the way he studied this process was by taking bandages from patients and studying their pus. It's kind of gross. But uh, what he was able to do with all this biological material is isolate human nuclei. And so he, this was the first sort of human cell system, if you will, and thank God we've gotten better ones. But um, the thing he found is that there's DNA in the nucleus, and he's like, this has got to be it. This DNA in here, this is probably the thing that's doing it. Everybody laughed at him. They said he was wrong, he's weird, all this stuff. Um, and the reason was is that DNA was known to be made up of four letters, A, T, G, and C, and there just wasn't enough information content there to be able to develop a whole human being. Um, and so for a long time, people thought DNA was too dumb to be this transforming principle and progress and sort of delayed progress in um, finding it. But then another clue came with, again, a technology development of a better and better microscopes. Herman Henneking um, wasn't the one who coined the term chromosome, but probably did the coolest things with them. Does anybody know where the word chromosome comes from? Come on, brave soul, I know somebody. Yep, you. Close, very close, good job. Um, so you're right about the colors, that's the chromo part, that means color. And soma is the other part of chromosome, so it means colored body. And it's actually really funny the way, the way this came to be is that people at this time, what they would do is just add dyes to cells. But their microscopes were good enough that they could see this dance happening. And one of their dyes, they had no idea what this was labeling, they just threw this thing in a cell and watched it. And one of them labeled these, these moving pieces right here. And Herman Henneking noticed, the, and what I like the way he put it, is this beautiful dance between the, they were purple flecks back then. These purple flecks would come around the cell and they'd all join up in the middle and then all run back away into two different cells. And he was like, these things are being transformed between these two cells, but didn't quite have the gumption to say this is probably the principal component of the transforming principle. Um, but he found was the X chromosome, and we'll talk more about this later, and he called it that for being excluded in this dance. One of, the X, one of these chromosomes, the X chromosome, which sort of sounds like a cool science fiction name, um, is put off, put off to the side and doesn't participate in this little purple dance that he had been seeing. Um, and later, that same, like 20 years later, uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan basically demonstrated that chromosomes indeed in, were able to manipulate what the outcome was uh, of two cell divisions. Um, then we knew later on that same year that genes were on chromosomes and genes made proteins that did functional things like make certain metabolites and pathways. He could kill certain regions of a chromosome but add back a metabolite and then the cell would be fine again. Um, and then finally, Avery, Oswald Avery and Hershey and Chase. It's, this is actually a funny story too. Oswald Avery, so chromo chromosomes had three components, DNA, RNA, and proteins in them. And so the search was on to figure out which of those three was actually the main driver of this information. And he, he showed this beautiful experiment, it's DNA. And he was, out, he was ostracized in this because he would started talking about it before he published it. And people said, no way, no way, it can't be. Your, can, your DNA is contaminated with proteins left over. You didn't strip all the proteins off. It's got to be the proteins. There's more information in the proteins. Um, but Her Hershey and Chase nailed it. They actually were able to synthesize, take each one of these things separately and follow it through sequential stages of cellular development or cellular divisions and found out that it was DNA, which laid the foundation for what is the inheritable, how does this work for inheritance? And we all know this, I'm guessing, the central dogma that DNA makes RNA makes protein. So this is a simple flow of information that DNA can be replicated, split between two cells, and contain all the information that can, a blueprint that RNA molecules can be sent off and then make proteins, and the proteins do all the jobs in the cell. And this was very satiable and, and seemed like the perfect answer for a long time. And then we became in the sequencing era, or what I like to call alphabet soup, where everybody, now that we knew DNA was the important thing, we knew how it would be the mechanism of inheritance, everybody and their brother wanted to sequence more and more genomes. Um, and so it really took a new technology, the Sanger sequencing method made this much easier um, versus the previous version, the Maxim Gilbert sequencing method, um, and was allowed us to see the first genome that sequenced, and Frederick Sanger did it himself. Um, the, and it was for a virus, and a measly 5,000 letters is what he got out, and this was a heroic victory. 
Now come two new technologies, the PCR, polymerase chain reaction, we all use it standardly in the lab and often take for granted what it did for us in the genomic era. What this allowed us to do was amplify up DNA so that we could sequence more and more and bigger and bigger genomes. Um, and then also Leroy Hood's invention of the automated sequencing machine allowed us to do this in a much more high throughput where you didn't have to have people doing this all day long. Um, and then this led to much bigger genomes. We went from the thousands to millions of base pairs and then finally ending up with the human genome in 2001 with billions of nucleotides uh, sequenced and placed together. Now, isn't it kind of ironic that this was the year 2001, like Space Odyssey 2001, you know, the monkey running with the little, the, so I like to think of this as Genome Odyssey 2001. 2001 was a big year, actually. Two important things happened. We not only got the genome, the, the blueprint of the human genome, but we also learned something about a, this thing called a histone code. And I'm going to tell you about a previous code we knew about, which was DNA methylation. But the premise of this is that DNA in the nucleus is compacted into chromosome structures that are sort of partitioned into regions that are on and off. And this patterning of on and off is what can tell us, tell the same genomic imprint what to be or what not to be. And so if we zoom in on one of these chromosomes, what we can see here is, I'll first talk about DNA methylation. This has been around much prior to 2001, but the fact that these two sort of synergized in the way we thought about how a cell would take shape or how the genome would take shape. So if you have a methyl, methyl a little carbon with three hydrogens, that's it. So all you got to do is put that on a DNA and you, it means that region of DNA is off. So we'll give it a blue bar for being off or cold. Um, and this one's off because of this methyl mark, but this one's on, 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 off, off. And so we can imagine this is a barcode of reading DNA. And now we have sequencers and all kinds of efforts at the Broad to sequence these methyl marks to be able to say in a liver cell, a brain cell, a kidney cell, what is the barcode of on and off series that is giving that a unique identity. The same way you'd scan a cereal box would have, Cheerios would have a different one from Captain Crunch. Um, but in 2001, David Alice devised this theory of the histone code, which had a lot of evidence to support it, where histones are the actual center pieces that the DNA wraps around and is packaged into. And these have modifications on them too that give the same sort of on-off code. So you can have off, off, on, 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 off, off. Again, being able to read the DNA into a barcode, and essentially, that's what is going on. Now, there are huge efforts at the Broad and nationwide, mostly at the Broad, actually, for every, to take every type of cell and read out these barcodes so that imagine one day you could sort of scan a genome and say, oh, that's a liver cell, that's a brain cell. And so why isn't this the answer? Why isn't this the end of my talk? Well, we got to ask now, this brings up a new question. This seems like the perfect model for how the genome is folded. You have on and off instructions. Um, but there's two problems. One is that DNA methylation is, is the most satiable answer to this problem because now you can split this DNA and it have a methyl strand in the mother and a methyl strand in the daughter cell and it could re reestablish the exact same genomic architecture. The problem is that many organisms don't have the enzymes to do this yet they can all make multiple different cell types that can reproduce themselves perfectly. Everybody's got histones, almost everybody, almost every organism. And so this one then now seems like maybe the universal principle. But now the big question comes, how did they get there in the first place? Who put them there? The exact same enzymes that do this, there's only a handful of these enzymes that can put these modifications on, and they're present in every cell in your body. So how does the same protein know to go to one place in one cell and go to a different place in another cell? So we're, what happened also at this same time, I just leave that question in the back of your mind, of how did they get there in the first place? And throughout this alphabet soup era, what people also started doing is sequencing RNA. And they were amazed that there was so much more RNA than they previously thought was possible. Not just these protein coding genes, but there was these RNA molecules that couldn't make proteins by the way we knew, that, by the rules we knew. Um, and what this did to the central dogma, which was this beautiful, nice answer, sort of like Newtonian um, physics, it was just beautiful until Einstein came around and made it, made it really kind of confusing, but, but actually cooler in the end. 
Um, and so what we started to notice is that there's non-coding RNA molecules that can cause an undertow of information flow in this process so that it can move backwards and forwards in a dynamic process where you can have microRNAs that will come in and block this step from an mRNA turning into a protein and you have these weird large non-coding RNAs that look just like a protein message but they actually can go and shut off DNA. And so this information at each step can now go backwards and forwards. And these are the ones I'm going to focus most of the talk on, on tonight. But so this, this dogma got really confusing, and people realized it was much more twisted than originally thought. In fact, it was so twisted that even Jim Watson, the guy who was in, responsible for setting up this dogma, sort of fell back and was uh, in amazement, saying, wow, <laughs> look at all these, these different things. This is from a Cold Spring Harbor retreat. He's such a good sport playing uh, Twister. And so it is. The central dogma seems a lot more twisted than, than we originally thought. And so we're back to our question now, what to be or not to be. And really, this brings back the question I just mentioned a second ago. How did those marks get there in the first place? Um, we know that we can read out a liver cell, a brain cell, a kidney cell, or a heart cell with these barcodes and scan them. But how did they get there? The same enzyme goes to different places in different cells. Well. This is what I suspect is the answer, and I'll hopefully try and give a case for this today. We only know of a couple examples of this, but this is what our lab is actively exploring and how they may be the sort of fundamental universal principle that every cell has RNA. And if you can use this RNA to guide these differentiations in the eukaryotic nucleus, we could do a lot of engineering with these RNAs, which I'll get to at the end of the talk. So let's take a quiz. Which of the following of these is a non-coding RNA? This is how I test if people are going to actually play this game. Who thinks C is a non-coding RNA? Raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five. Come on, more. Come on. I just showed a picture of it. <laughs> OK, so C is indeed a non-coding RNA. Um, it's, it's a microRNA. It's the one that blocks our mRNAs turning into proteins. But it turns out one of A and B is also a, prote is, is also a non-coding RNA. And one of them is a protein-coding gene. And there is almost no way to tell this. There is no way anybody could tell this just by looking at it. So what you have here is hot air is a non-coding RNA I'll talk about in a minute that has multiple exonic structures. Exons are the piece of the protein mRNA that come together to make the full amino acid sequence. And in between them are these things called introns, which are spliced out, and then the exons get put together. But why would a non-coding RNA also do this? It seems kind of weird. It's a non-coding RNA. Why not just make it as a big stretch of RNA? Why put these introns in there? Um, and so it's quite fascinating that they have all the exact same properties, but this one will make a standard protein for energy metabolism, head off to the ribosome, and do its job. But this guy will serve as a non-coding, as an RNA molecule itself. And so there's all kinds of other RNAs in the cell that I don't want to be remiss in not mentioning, but there's small RNAs, there's medium ones, there's all kinds of goofy flavors of these things. But I just really want to focus tonight on, on this type here um, that I've become fascinated with over the, the, the past many years. And so what can these things do? Why is this even important? Well, what's the difference between Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt? They're both beautiful. They're both successful actors and actresses, and uh, they both do great things around the world, you know, and adopt lots of babies. The, but they, the one thing Angelina's got over Brad is she's got two X chromosomes. She's got two full chromosomes. The Y is a broken off little piece of the X chromosome. So kind of, us guys are kind of genetically a little broken off piece of what was left over of this X chromosome. And Angelina expresses a single non-coding RNA molecule, these large non-coding RNA molecules, multiple exons. And this single RNA molecule can shut off an entire chromosome. That's powerful precedent. So women like to give us guys a fair chance by shutting off one of their X chromosomes so we each have only one X and so nobody gets in a huff. Um, <laughs> and and keep, it, keep it equal. Um, and this is Herman Henneking's X chromosome with more modern technology and mo microscopes. This RNA is caking this chromosome so that it can't be transcribed or make any of its proteins. And it's shown here, whereas this is the one that's open. You can see the RNA is not localized there. Um, and this is the same reason why your cats have multiple patterns of fur, because the, f the color gene on cats is on the X chromosome. And since these X chromosomes in females are randomly inactivated, you might turn off the orange color in one cell and keep on the black and vice versa, and you get these patterns and patches of color. Um, 
So that's a pretty powerful precedent. One RNA destroying an entire chromosome. Imagine if we could engineer, or harness that power. Um, that's a serious fold in the, that's like taking the origami and just going <laughs> That's probably the easiest shape to make there is. Um, and the skin is another example of where this can take place. The skin is often one of the most neglected organs. It's huge. It's the largest organ in our body. If you look at this guy holding this here, that's impressive. <laughs> that's a big organ. And it's large and contiguous and covers your entire body. It always remains intricate sites of cellular specialization. Even when you go from a little baby to a full adult, your hand grows and expands, but hopefully hair will never grow on your palm, but will always grow on top of your head. Um, and so how do these cells know to do this and keep this information in, in place? Well, during my postdoc, we found out that there's a genetic GPS system, so to speak, where the same way a GPS will tell you your latitude, longitude, and altitude and pinpoint where you are on Earth, we learned that we could pinpoint where skin cells were in the body by using anterior, posterior, proximal and distal, and internal and external um, axes. And it's not perfect. We can only get these kind of rough anatomical locations. But what was even more exciting is that part of this code was regulated by another non-coding RNA molecule that we called hot air. Because um, we wanted to be a little humble about what it was doing since it was a little, little iffy at the time. Um, and so this is two examples of what these weird, large, non-coding RNA molecules can do. And we know of a few more. So this is a, a picture from a recent review. Um, a lot of everything you see here is mostly small RNAs. We know a lot about small RNAs, but very little about these big guys. Um, and we maybe know about a dozen or so of these large non-coding RNAs. We wanted to know if there could be more. Um, and we wanted to think of a new way of finding these things rather than sequencing the RNA molecules themselves, which has amassed this huge dust cloud of transcription that is even accumulated to the entire genome being transcribed. I'm one person with a small lab that just started. I can't tackle the whole genome all at once. But what I wanted to do is find a few more clues to see if we can start finding general trends in what these were doing and then go tackle the entire genome. Um, and so what we did is we did something completely different than other people had been doing. We looked for protein coding genes. These things look just like protein coding genes. They have the exons, they're spliced together. And uh, work with Mitch Gutman, who's in the audience here tonight. What, what he, we noticed is that you could look for, for histone modifications, those things that were packaging the DNA, those modifications on the tail that says whether it's on or off. Well, there's even different flavors of on. There's on meaning start. So this green one here is a modification that tells you where the gene is starting. And the blue one tells you where it starts and stops. So as the polymerase goes through the DNA and makes the RNA, I like to think of this as like a boat going through the water. There's a wake, so to speak. And that wake leaves these modifications that we can recognize. So together, these will tell us where new gene loci are. And since we know where all the protein coding genes and have known for a while now are, mostly what we might find is new non-coding RNAs. And the reason we thought this is because hot air looks just like this, um, would have this exact same signature. So what we did, or what Mitch did, is he went through and looked at all these maps and that are being generated here at the Broad to find these barcodes, right? So people are generating all these barcode maps, and we can actually utilize these to find novel genetic elements. Um, so here's one of these maps, and we can see here's that start mark, and here's the start and stop. Um, again, another one, start and stop. But these are protein coding genes, and we know, uh, whatever. So the, we wanted to focus on these other guys that are sitting in intergenic space, not overlapping with anybody else, um, and see what's in there. What could these things be? Well, I'll make the answer short. It turns out they're non-coding RNAs, just like hot air and exist. Multiple exons spliced together, shown here. Here's the sort of start and stop of one of these guys. And if we look and, and see how big the transcript is inside the cell, we see that it matches the same size of the exons in, underneath this sort of wake of transcription. And um, I'm going to simplify this and let you know that they're non-coding. The, the way we did this is a little complex, but very robust. And you can see these black boxes here are the few known examples of these large non-coding RNAs. They have this type of score. Whereas protein coding genes are way over here. So we can easily distinguish which one is which. Um, and so it turns out 95% of these of the, the link are, what, so we call them large intergenic non-coding RNAs, or link RNAs. And I like to think of them as the missing links in the transcriptome. Um, 
And what these guys, uh, they don't have coding potential, and there's about 5,000 of them in the human genome. We're pretty confident that we're getting close, plus or minus 1,000. There could be a few more, um, but we've looked through lots and lots of barcode data, let's, let's put it that way. Um, and so what was the most interesting thing about these uh, link RNAs is that they're conserved throughout evolution. So another effort going on at the Broad is to sequence many um, placental mam mammalian genomes and align these genomes to understand where regions have not evolved rapidly, meaning they may be important because they don't like mutations. And sort of a representation of this is shown here, where um, this is a neutral part of the genome, doesn't care if it gets mutated, doesn't really have any function. Um, and you can see all these mutations occurring here um, wherever there's a letter, there's a mutation. Wherever there's a dash, it means it stayed the same. And you can see over here, by contrast, there's many fewer letters um, that have been mutated. And so we wanted to see where link RNAs fit in this, in this scheme. And so here's neutral here, shown in red, and conserved is shown here in green. Turns out link RNAs are dead center in the middle. But this is actually an amazing amount of conservation compared to what had been seen before. And so this indicated to us that maybe these are functional through evolution. However, it is important to know that we don't want to be blinded by this either. We don't want to exclude RNAs that aren't conserved. They could also be important, um, and we'll get to that later. Um, but this is, again, a first stepping stone to understand more than just these few examples we currently know and see if we can start developing a catalog in general th trends and themes. Um, and so it turns out these link RNAs are as highly, if not more, conserved than the few known examples we know today. Um, and other parts of RNA molecules that are known to be functional, these, these show similar levels of conservation. So now why would this be somewhere dead in the middle of a protein coding gene in neutral? Well, a protein coding gene does not want to mess with its amino acids. It needs every single one of them, and there's many diseases where a single amino acid gets changed, that protein falls apart and it's not functional, you can get a disease. Whereas RNA is a little more flexible. It's built up of two different things. Stems, which are regions of the RNA that come together and hybridize, and loops that join these stems. And so what we might be seeing here is this evolutionary or sequence constraint on the stems and not the loops, because they have to have a matching partner, so a mutation there may block that, that partnering um, together. Um, so now that we know we've found a, a bunch of these link RNAs and we think they're functional based on this evolutionary conservation, what do they do is the next big question. And so to do this, we did a, what I like to call CSI link RNA, where we take this, this piece of glass I'm showing here. This thing costs $1,000, okay? I'm in the wrong business. You can make a lot of money with glass. But it looks just like a normal glass microscope slide that you, you would have in the lab. But if you look, I don't know if you guys can see here. So see, it looks just blank, right? I feel like a, like a magician now. <laughs> OK, so it's blank. Uh, I'll, I'll give you can have this one if you want it. I got to make sure I get this right. OK, so abracadabra. You see something there? There's a square in the middle. Okay, is that worth $1,000? Probably not. <laughs> Although, I try and milk it and do this to, to make it seem more. Did you want this? Here, you can have it. Okay. <laughs> um, but in that little square are 2.1 million dots of DNA. And I like to think of that as looking over Manhattan from an airplane. If you look over Manhattan, you see this nice, beautifully gridded network. And if you see lights on in the Empire State Building, you know that maybe the investment bankers are at hard at work or downtown in Wall Street. And if you see lights on in other different buildings, you can tell who's working, so to speak. And this microarray does that exact same thing. If an RNA is present in a cell, it glows. And then we can tell what cell a link RNA or a non-coding RNA is in. And we can also look at what protein coding genes are in that cell at the exact same time on the same glass slide. And so what we did is we, we did this in the same way a, a, a crime investigation person would profile criminals to see who fits the bill for the crime, we're going to do this with link RNAs. And so this, this is how we do that. So in all the, the following data I'll show you, anytime you see something red in one of these maps, it means it's on or it's hot, it's glowing. And if it's off, it's cold, it's blue. Um, 
And what we can do is we, we don't know anything about this link RNA. We have no idea what it does. But we can infer what it may be doing by the types of protein coding genes that have the exact same pattern. Um, so for instance, we can then look across multiple different tissues, and I'm just showing a few here. Um, and by association, they're going to be on and off in different patterns. And so are the protein coding genes that we know what they do. And so we can see here that this link RNA correlates very well with this cellular pathway or this set of protein coding genes. So we'll give it a red box for being correlated. Fatty acid metabolism doesn't seem to be associated with the patterning of this non-coding RNA and probably has nothing to do with its function. And finally, we can have relation, and so we give it a white box. And finally, we can have uh, inferences where it's the exact opposite pattern as the link RNA, and we'll give it a blue box. And we can now go through every single protein coding pathway we know about to date and sort of hone in on what, what pathways this link RNA can and cannot be involved in. Um, and through some magic, fancy uh, informatics, we can cluster these things together by their common functionalities. I'm going to talk about two clusters that emerged from this analysis. One shown here, where there's a lot of genes, uh, protein coding genes, that associate with link RNAs involved in cell cycle proliferation and regulation. And this is the crux of cancer. You don't want cells to proliferate too much, and you want to keep them proliferating enough to be able to regenerate cells. The other one, had a strong correlation with protein coding genes that are important in keeping a stem cell a stem cell. We've learned a lot about stem cell biology, and we know the key proteins involved in that, um, that keeping it a stem cell, and we saw a strong association of link RNAs. And so I'll talk about these two systems now. We'll start with the easier one, ES cells. We got a stem cell. Does everybody know what a stem cell is? It's a cell that can turn into any other type of cell, essentially. You can have it turn into a liver cell, a brain cell. It's that flat piece of paper we've been talking about um, for the origami. And what we found is that even though this, this was predicted using one set of tissues, and now we actually go look into that tissue and ask, does it seem to be stem cell specific? And it, amazingly, it was. You can see these link RNAs are highly red in ES cells, but very are not quite as on as much in other cell types shown here. But what's even more remarkable about that is that 93% of these link RNAs, so by the way, each line here is a link RNA, and each column is a different tissue. And I'll show a few more of these sort of graphs. Um, but every link RNA, or almost all of them, were regulated by the core transcriptional machinery of an ES cell, meaning that they were bound on that green promoter where the gene was going to, where the non-coding RNA was going to start, and are regulating it. That's another big clue that these things may be involved in stem cell biology. And we validated this through an, an assay that's not worth getting into right now. But basically, if you add this promoter to an artificial system, it will turn it on. And these link RNAs are being turned on by these, this core machinery of a stem cell. In fact, this core machinery is so potent. Have you guys heard about this new discovery? I think this is the coolest thing since the central dogma, is that you can take a skin cell and turn it into a stem cell. And we now know people can do this all the time. All kinds of labs around here are doing it. And now we've sort of picked up on the bandwagon um, in order to study link RNAs. And so you can add these four magic factors, the same magic factors that are turning on these link RNAs I was just talking about. And then you can isolate um, at a very low frequency. About 1% of these skin cells will actually turn into stem cells. And so we know protein coding genes, lots of studies have been done to show that the fibroblast has its own set of genes shown here in red that, excuse me, go from on to off. And more importantly, fibroblast genes that were never on turn on, and these are maybe the genes that are important for becoming an ES cell. Now, these are protein coding genes, and protein coding genes are boring to us. What was more interesting is that link RNAs were doing the same thing. We have a whole set of link RNAs right here that were not on in the progenitor cell. And we actually started doing something different where we took different types of skin cells. Remember this GPS system? Well, it turns out skin cells are not just skin cells, and there's actually differences. But no matter what your previous identity was, you erase it. So these are four different flavors of fibroblasts. All of them turned on these sort of RNAs, and many of them are the ones that we had seen on in ES cells, indicating, again, through an independent system, they may be playing a role. But this is all correlation, and I'm not up here to make a bunch of you know, correlative uh, statements. Um, but let's look at some proof. 
So this is what happens during normal, um, when you take a skin cell and turn it into an ES cell. Every one of these black dots here is an ES colony. You can add a certain enzyme and it'll make the ES colonies turn black or green or whatever color you want them to turn, and so you can isolate them out of this dish of, of mostly skin cells. Now, we, through a lot of work that it's not important how, but we sort of honed in on a key candidate that was regulated by this machinery, it was involved in, in ES cells, and you knock it out, you get very, very few black dots, if any at all. So what this indicates is that this link RNA is important in the transition from a skin cell to a stem cell, just the same way protein coding genes are important in turning a uh, skin cell into a stem cell. And so now Mitch Gutman is uh, fearless. He's a computer scientist, one that found all these guys in the first place looking through these maps, has developed a system to be able to go through and knock out every single one of those 118 uh, link RNAs I told you about in ES cells. And we picked one because we wanted to see if it was possible, and it turned out it was actually we picked five, and one of them worked. Um, but the way Mitch is doing this is you can, you can make these ES cells green and you can use a bunch of fancy robots that we have at the Broad. The Broad is like Disneyland for scientists. <laughs> Most scientists think about doing one experiment or whatever. We think about doing thousands at once and it's so much fun. And so even though he's normally used to sitting behind a computer, he's taken on this challenge of designing ways of, of destroying these link RNAs in, in collaboration with um, Alex Meisner's group here at the Broad and watching them seeing which link RNAs make the green go away. And he's been very successful at doing this in a, in a high throughput way, and we can e easily distinguish between a normal ES cell that's green and one that lost its function here, shown here. Um, so that's ongoing, and hopefully I can show you hundreds of pictures of dishes with lots of black dots, and very few black dots sometimes. Um, that's sort of the, the ultimate goal. And also, the idea is that if we can figure out what these link RNAs are doing in ES cells, maybe they could be magic factors that could be incorporated into this mix to make more ES cells. Um, so the other sort of pattern we saw was cell cycle regulation. In a subset, there's a lot of link RNAs in here, but a subset of them seem to be very specifically regulated by a protein called P53. Does anybody know what P53 is? No? Buddy, come on, with the chromosome? <laughs> no? Okay. Well, P53 is the most important, it's the, the gene that is most highly mutated in all of cancers. It's called the guardian of the genome. So when, what happens is, let's say you're out in the sun too long, the sun beats up your genome, it causes mutations. Well, P53 will turn on and make, look around and say, okay, I see some damage here, I don't want to propagate these errors, let's fix them. And if we can't fix them, let's just kill it, we're done, we'll, we'll commit suicide. And so that's why it's the guardian of the cells. Anytime there's damage or mutations, it pops up, looks around, sees if everything's okay, and if it's not, it kills the cell. Um, and so we were fascinated by, by link RNAs that could be so tightly correlated with this very potent uh, protein coding gene. Um, so we'll talk about that now. So the, the details don't matter, don't get confused, but here's one of these magic glass slides with the square in the middle um, that we can now take independent systems. So again, this was a prediction done with one set of, of data. And now we're going to go test it with a di completely different set of data. And we wanted to be even more careful and do this in two separate systems. So we teamed up with Tyler Jax's lab at MIT um, and, and did this. And in each case, in each of these two systems, you have a normal cell with wild type P53 and you have a knockout cell. And so what we can do is add this damage and watch P53 turn on and cells that it can't so we can get rid of any noise that may be happening and see if these link RNAs turn on when P53 turns on, and in both systems. And amazingly, what we found is 32 of the 39 from that cluster indeed showed this temporal induction that as soon as P53 started coming on, these guys also turned on. Further indication that if P53 is this important and it's turning on these link RNAs, they may be important in this cancer process as well and give us new clues into treatments and therapies. But one of them was very, very cool. And it's, it's hard to explain why it's cool, but to, to real nerds, it's cool. Um, and this gene right here is one of P53's first and classic known targets. It was like one of the first key, so back 20 years ago when people found P53, they wanted to know who it was turning on by protein coding genes. And now we're 20 years later trying to figure out, or 25, 30 years later, trying to figure out who's turning on the, which link RNAs P53 is turning on. And how coincidental is that there's one sitting right next to one of the first targets ever discovered. That was really exciting to us. 
And we pursued this, but we didn't want to get too excited without a little more evidence. And so what we did is you could design this assay where you hook up the promoter of this link RNA to a glowing enzyme. It's the same thing that makes uh, fireflies glow. So when you try and catch them, and they have the, their butt glows green. That's the same sort of enzyme that we're using here. So if P53 steps on this promoter and actually turns it on, it'll glow. And we can monitor that. And what you see is that if you have a P53 cell deficient cell or a cancer cell, you can't turn on this link RNA. But if you then turn P53 on, you, you activate this link RNA very, very much. And so another piece of evidence we wanted to be double sure with is that if in the normal cell we take away P53, we'd expect the RNA to actually start going down. Indeed, that's exactly what happens. You knock down, this is normal, you knock down P53, and this link RNA starts to disappear. So together we now know P53 is directly regulating this link RNA, and we have other evidence that I won't go into that of why this is happening, but now we know this guy's probably really important because P53 doesn't just mess around and transcribe anybody. So P53, again, a very interesting protein. And in most transcription factors, P53 is a transcription factor, turn on genes. And, but it's also known that these transcription factors turn off genes. And this makes a lot of sense. You wouldn't want an interfering program. So when the damage comes on, if there was some noise on in the background, P53 would want that to be quiet so it could go around looking for damaged um, regions of the genome. And so we wanted to see where link P21 fit in in this process because we had seen this one RNA shut off an entire chromosome. We suspected that maybe these RNAs were involved in shutting off these genes, that this mysterious mechanism of shutting off genes. So to do this, we did a, what's called an epistasis experiment where you knock out each protein separately and ask what genes they share in common. So we knocked out P53, we knock out link P21, we profiled on those magic glass slides, and what we saw was almost a thousand genes that overlapped in this regulation. This further indicated to us that this is involved in the P53 pathway. But what's more exciting is that when you look at these genes that are shared between these two different knockdowns, almost all of them are turning on, which means they were normally shut off in this process. And so it indicates that link P21 seems to be acting somewhere in this repressive pathway. And if we look at what genes it's repressing, they're known to be involved in the P53 pathway, cell death, cell cycle regulation, and proliferation. So is this, if this is important, we should see something happen to the cell if we take this guy away. So what happens normally, as I was saying, in a normal cell, you add a damaged agent. If it can't fix it, it decides to commit suicide. And that's what you're looking at here, a bunch of dead cells. They, they kind of crumple up into these little crusty dots. Um, and then what happens if you knock out P53, it can no longer come up and check the genome, and cells can grow on and on and on. And this is what's happened in cancer. Our cells get a mutation in P53, and they can continue to grow and grow and grow. So link P21, interestingly, has a very similar phenotype to P53, although not as potent. If you remove this RNA, the cell is much less actively able to degrade these cells and cause cellular death. Now maybe this isn't because link P21 is important for keeping that background noise quiet. Um, but we wanted to know how this could be happening. How could link P21 be part of this regulatory process of checking the genome? And so to do this, we do a fishing experiment. We've all gone fishing, right? So we're going to, instead of use a worm, we're going to use an RNA. And on this RNA, there's hooks that are going to catch proteins, you're going to grab them right, right out of the cell. And the way we do this is we incubate them, so we throw them in the lake of the cellular milieu, this lake, and we go fishing. And as a control, we want to use um, bait, a, a, a lure with no bait. So the fish wouldn't really want to, they'd accidentally bite that one. Um, and so we can do this, and now we have a way of pulling or reeling in this bait in the cell and seeing what's bound to it. We first wash away anything that's nonspecific, and then we can see what came down um, with our specific hook, um, and that's shown here is this band. And through a magic technology called mass spectrometry, we can identify what that protein is. In this case, it's HNR and PK. Hooray! Eureka, right? Well, no. So it's not much is known about this protein, although what it is known about it is that it's involved in shutting off P53 genes previously in the literature. And so if you look at the signal that this, this complex, so HNRPK and LINK-P21 are in this complex here that's known to turn off P53 genes. 
but the signal is the same. You have P53 in both cases. How the heck does it know to go here and not there? Well, maybe link, R, link P21 may be modulating where it goes in the genome. And this is going to be the sort of key theme that we're going to start to see. The same way hot air told different complexes to go to different places in the genome, maybe link P21 is doing the same thing. And indeed, that's what we think the case is. And so we can imagine a model where P53 comes on, turns on a polymerase to make link P21. Link P21 gets made, hooks up with the repressor HNR and PK. That's the other good thing is HNR and PK is known to be a repressor. And that's what we'd seen a lot of these genes shut off. Um, and selectively pick which promoters should be shut off through some unknown mechanism. Um, and this is very similar to, as I was saying, what we saw for hot air. Hot air bound to a different repressor, and actually an ancient repressor called polycomb. The details of it don't matter, except for that almost every organism, all the way back to fruit flies, have this, this um, enzyme, and it's part of putting those off tails on histones. So as the DNA gets packaged, this protein is one of the main ones responsible for saying, this is an off histone um, here. And what we know about hot air is it's made on one uh, chromosome, binds this repressor, and specifically shuts off a related region on a different chromosome. And this is happening in trans. And recently, more recently, we now know that this exact same mechanism is keeping Brad and Angelina different. That this RNA uh, exists, binds to polycomb again, brings it to the X chromosome specifically, and shuts off just the X chromosome. It doesn't affect any of the other chromosomes. So there's some selectivity going on here. They're very negative molecules. They're shutting stuff off, but there's some selectivity in where they're going. And so we want to see, could this be a global mechanism? Could these things be air traffic controllers of the cell? Um, and so to do this, we did another fishing experiment, but now we're going to hook proteins. Um, we're going to pull out polycomb and see if we can identify which link RNAs are associated with it. Um, and we do another control where the antibody that can't recognize polycomb, just in case any material accidentally falls down in this experiment. And so again, we wash away any nonspecific interactions in the two um, experiments, and then put these things back down on the magic glass slide that will identify which link RNAs are working, or where they, if they're bound to this repressor. And nowadays, we're doing this with these high-throughput sequencing machines, which the Broad is essentially a warehouse of powerful sequencers. Um, and so we can get um, much more identity. We're limited by what's on this chip using this approach, but we can also sequence everything that's in there. Um, and so what was amazing to us is that 24% or a quarter of all the link RNAs expressed in a given cell were bound to polycomb, clearly indicating that this is at least a widespread phenomenon, that hundreds of these link RNAs are associating with this protein and maybe guiding it to specific regions in the genome. Again, getting at where are these folds and creases in the paper coming from? Or how did those marks get there in the first place? What's really cool is if you look at these inside the cell, in, so this is the nucleus of a cell in purple here. And this is exists, that excluded chromosome here, lights up as a big, bright white dot. And what that means to, to, to us is that there's a large region of compacted DNA. The DNA is off, and it's compacted and inaccessible. But what we also see is just the way EXIST does this is other non-coding RNAs are making these big regions shut off, it looks like. Now, we don't know that they're actually doing it yet, but it's an implication that there's, they're actually acting on large spanses of DNA. And here's another example here. Um, and so now we can sort of imagine a global mechanism where we have hundreds of these link RNAs associating with this polycomb complex to turn regions off and numerous transcription factors that may turn them on, just like P53 did, make the link RNA, bind a repressor, either polycomb or HNRPK or any of the other four or five repressive enzymes, and guide them to certain regions of the genome to shut them off. Now, this is very similar to what happens every single day in the skies in, around the world. This is a movie of air traffic all day throughout, through the day around the world. Every yellow dot here is an airplane. Imagine if we didn't have air traffic controllers. This would be a mess. Planes would be crashing into each other. They'd be landing in the wrong places. All kinds of madness would happen. But as you can see, there's a very concerted, and if you watch this enough times, which I have, unfortunately, now, um, 
you can see very clear patterns of where these planes are landing and going and breathing and flowing in and out, the same way you might imagine as a cell is dividing, the planes have to come back in. That's nighttime, so to speak, and daytime when the cell is doing its normal thing. And this cycle repeats itself over and over again. And so it might be important for the cell to have an air traffic controller tower to be able to guide these proteins that are floating around in every single cell and put them down in certain cities or locations. That's one analogy. And so what we can sort of think of this as is the way these marks or these barcodes get put on to put cells on or to, to tell a cell what to be or not to be is by these associated RNAs that bind to repressor complexes and bring them to certain regions of the genome. And it gets at that second part of the question is how does the same cell then divide and remake the exact same cell? Well, imagine we have a cell about to divide. It has now a code of non-coding RNAs in it. So when the cell splits, it'll have equal representation of each code. Air traffic control comes in, the planes come back down, and we reshut off specific regions of the genome to make this on-off, on-off, on-off barcode that's indicative of a very specific cell type. And so we can imagine all sorts of different RNAs being expressed in different cells as different ways of telling it where to go in, in what situation. And so the future of this is to take this mechanism and understand how these RNAs are driving ES cells to different cellular fates and um, how, so how they're making it self-renew. Um, and we think that these RNAs are going to be playing a major role in this process. And if we could crack this code of genomic origami and know where these folds are being placed in the genome, we could reverse engineer these molecules to build designer genomes or break, repair broken genomes. So imagine you fold up your crane and you got your crane and it's flapping around, it's fine. But then you get cancer and your genome breaks. You've only got one wing and you're, you're trying to fly around and do your thing. If we knew where that fold was that broke, we could engineer an RNA molecule to go back in there, get it back up, and get that cancer genome back flying the way it should be. And so it's not diseased anymore. Moreover, we can imagine taking a piece of your skin, turning it into a stem cell, and then programming a code of non-coding RNAs into that cell to make a liver cell, a brain cell, sort of like RNA tweezers, essentially, building exactly the right cell type so that if you have a liver problem, maybe we could engineer your own skin cell to turn into your own liver cell. Um, using this code of non-coding RNAs. I also like to think of this as puppet strings. The orchestration of a puppet show has lots to do with these strings organizing the whole cast into, um, into a functional story. Um, and so that's the sort of long-term pie-in-the-sky goal for where we're going. We have a long ways to go. As I've shown you, we've only stumbled across a couple more of these, but now that we have the principles in place, we can use the Broad robots, put this thing on steroids, and really hammer it. And that's what we've just sort of started acquiring money to do. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everybody at the Broad. Everybody in blue here is a collaborator at the Broad. You can see it's pretty much a Broad-driven uh, enterprise here. Uh, members of the lab, um, Maite worked on the uh, P53 cancer story. Ahmed sort of been working on the air traffic controller story with Mitch. And Mitch is pretty much just involved in everything. Um, and Mitch and Manuel, I should say, are actually involved in everything. These two work as a team. Um, in fact, I'm almost excluded from their team now because they're just off and running and they, they know pretty much everything at this point. Um, and also Eric Lander and Aviv Regev are two other Broad members that are uh, two of my closest collaborators. And we're really excited about the next couple of years and what we're going to find in stem cell biology and how to manipulate RNAs to engineer the genome. And so with that, I'd like to thank you guys and take any questions. Yeah, that was day and night. Pardon? That was That's day and day and, night. Night. day and night. So you know how the Earth's a circle, so that they, they make these wave patterns of day and night. So you could see that at night, 
Europe, when Europe was in the dark, America was in the day. So there was a lot more yellow in the day in America and a lot less yellow in Europe at night. And that's what I was trying to get at this cycle of a cell that's going through a day and a night cycle process where in certain regions you don't need it going there and then in the daylight you do. Yeah? Can you say what keeps the, uh, the non-coding RNA from interfering with the translation process? No, in fact, we wonder if it does. doesn't play a role in that as well. Um, we haven't looked into that yet, but it is very possible that these RNAs could also, they seem to be very negative and like to shut stuff off. So another way they could do this is shutting off the transition from an mRNA to a, to a protein coding gene. And we've actually have efforts looking at that exact, that exact thing. Can you say what you use to identify, to discriminate non-coding? Uh, it's really, I could definitely talk about it after, but basically we use that evolution of mutations. Proteins don't mutate in their exons. So we can look at how frequently something's mutating within an exon and, and whether the mutations make detrimental contributions to the protein. So certain amino acids are greasy and some are electrostatic. And if you see a greasy amino acid turning into electrostatic one, you know it's not a protein. And so we can scan the whole RNA and look for those types of mutations and these things are full of them. And also lots of stop codons are put in throughout the transcript which indicates it's not protein coding. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a good question. So are link RNAs keeping a stem cell a stem cell, or, or is our goal to add these things and, and turn them into other cells? And the answer is both. So, so Mitch's project is to knock them down in stem cells and to see if the stem cell starts spontaneously differentiating. Then we know it's important in keeping a stem cell a stem cell. But we know if we did that with every protein coding gene, everyone wouldn't cause a stem cell to, to all of a sudden start differentiating and no longer be able to be a stem cell. On the other point, I didn't clarify this, and I'm glad you brought it up, is what we're doing is we're learning at which link RNAs are in each of the differentiated cell states. So if we can find ones that are very specific to a brain cell, we can imagine putting those into a stem cell and saying, does this, does this give it a propensity to, to turn more into a brain cell than any other cell type? So we're looking at both the ones that are endogenously in an ESL, taking them out and seeing if they start to let, not become an ESL, which means they're required for that, and also how to program using analysis from other cell types, program a stem cell to start running towards a certain cell fate. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I'll repeat the question. That one of the problems for the naysayers on this, because this kind of rocks the boat, yeah. is that the, these molecules could be um, noise. And yeah. you address that a little bit. But then looking at this with the P53, yeah. I thought that's the end of that argument. Is that, I mean, if, yeah. if you can't make the noise argument. Right. So, so people have been, this is another amazing point, and you've been doing your homework and reading. This field has been riddled. So I started this, doing this work when I was a graduate student in 1990. The question was, oh, I was going to rephrase it, but the, the question was, are these things just noise? Okay? And so this has been a big controversy in the field for the past 10 years, is that these RNA molecules, oh, they're weird, they're just noise coming out of genomic experiments. And what she mentioned is that stuff like the P53 experiment shows that clearly they're not noise anymore. And that's become, the, the dogma has now just started to turn. So people have spent the past 10 years trying to find these things. And then the, the fact that the whole genome was transcribed, people said, oh, they're just noise. And so I said, I, and I was one of these people who had found that they're, they're everywhere. And so that kind of hurt my feelings when they were saying, oh, it's all crap. And so I, I wanted to really start nailing these things and saying, what can they do? And of course, we've only come up with a few examples at this point, but it's those few examples that have stopped this controversy of, oh, they're just noise. And it's really getting people, and that's been one of my goals, is getting people to get past that idea and see if there is something in there. And that's why we started with these few that were conserved, and we'll move on to these things that are less conserved and considered noise, because we still think they may possibly be doing stuff as well. Down again, and I'm sure he'll be willing to take more. Yeah, I'll be outside down. here.